Throughout history, there have been numerous individuals who, driven by sheer malice, excessive personal ambition, or facing dire circumstances, made the fateful decision to betray their families, comrades, friends, communities, or even their own nations, bearing the grievous consequences of their actions. Let's explore the lives of some of history's most notorious traitors. Karl Churda, a Czechoslovak soldier who fought in World War II, was born in 1911 in Trebon, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now part of the Czech Republic. During the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia, Churda managed to flee the country and successfully joined the Czechoslovak forces operating in exile in Great Britain. Trained by the British, he attained the rank of Sergeant Major and was dispatched back to his homeland with a group of men to combat the Nazis. In the operation dubbed Operation Anthropoid, though not directly involved, Churda was privy to the plan. The Allied forces sought to assassinate Reinhard Heydrich, one of the highest-ranking German SS officers, notorious as the Butcher of Prague, the Hangman, and the Blonde Beast. The principal executors of the operation were Josef Gabčík and Jan Kubisch. Though the assassination attempt was far from precise, shrapnel from a grenade struck Heydrich, ultimately leading to his demise. Following the assassination, Gabčík, Kubisch, and five other men hid in the underground crypt of the Cathedral of Saints Cyril and Methodius in Prague. In the ensuing days, the Nazi authorities relentlessly hunted down the perpetrators, committing numerous atrocities and executing innocent civilians. In a reprehensible act of betrayal, Churda disclosed the whereabouts of his comrades. The small group found themselves swiftly encircled by Nazi forces and, despite putting up a valiant fight for hours, succumbed, with most opting for suicide over capture. Churda received a reward of one million German Reichsmarks for his treachery and was provided with a new identity. However, following the conclusion of World War II, he was apprehended by Czechoslovak partisans. During his trial, when queried about his betrayal, Churda retorted, I believe you would have done the same for a million Reichsmarks. Found guilty of treason, Karl Churda met his fate at the gallows on April 29, 1947. Robert Ford was an American outlaw born in 1862. When he was only 18 years old, thanks to the mediation of his brother, Charlie Ford, Robert got to meet the legendary outlaw, Jesse James, whom he idolized. Shortly after, Jesse James allowed him to join his criminal gang. However, in 1882, in a treacherous act that would go down in infamy, Robert Ford, taking advantage of Jesse James's distraction while cleaning a picture, shot him in the back of the head. It was later revealed that Ford had struck a deal with Governor Thomas T. Crittenden, securing a full pardon and a sum of $10,000 in exchange for delivering Jesse James, the most wanted outlaw of the time, dead or alive. Thus, Robert Ford earned the notorious title of the man who killed Jesse James. Years later, in 1892, Robert Ford met his own demise when a man named Edward O'Kelly entered his saloon and fatally shot him in the neck. Although there are several theories surrounding O'Kelly's motive for the killing, including one suggesting a quest for notoriety, no conclusive evidence was ever presented, and O'Kelly remained silent on the matter. Consequently, O'Kelly became known as the man who killed the man who killed Jesse James. Despite being sentenced to life imprisonment, O'Kelly's release came after nine years, partly due to the substantial support garnered from over 7,000 signatures advocating for his freedom, fueled by Jesse James's considerable following, and partly due to his deteriorating health. However, shortly after his release, O'Kelly met his end at the hands of Joseph Grant Burnett, a police officer with whom he had an altercation, thus earning Burnett the grim distinction of the man who killed the man who killed the man who killed Jesse James. Ephialtes was a citizen of ancient Greece who played a pivotal role in one of the most renowned battles of the Second Persian War, which saw an alliance of various polis, or Greek cities, against the Persians of the Achaemenid Empire. 
In 480 BC, during the famous Battle of Thermopylae, Spartan King Leonidas, along with approximately 5,000 soldiers from across Greece, attempted to stop the advance of the vast Persian army. Some ancient historians estimated this force at 4 million men, though modern estimates suggest a figure closer to 250,000. Leonidas and his forces took up positions at the Thermopylae Pass, hoping that the pass's narrowness would help compensate for their significant numerical disadvantage. After four days of waiting, on the fifth day, Persian King Xerxes, the first, finally ordered his light infantry to attack the pass. Surprisingly, the Greeks easily withstood the assault. Frustrated, Xerxes then deployed the Immortals, his elite units. Again, the Greeks held firm. On the sixth day, Xerxes ordered another assault. But the Persian attacks continued to be ineffective against the Greeks. According to the historian Herodotus, it was at this point that Ephialtes emerged. A member of the Greek tribe of the Malians, and familiar with the local geography, Ephialtes betrayed his countrymen by informing King Xerxes of an alternate route that bypassed the Thermopylae Pass, allowing the Persian forces to encircle the Greek defenders. Upon learning of the betrayal, and knowing he would be outflanked by the Persian army, Leonidas ordered the majority of his troops to withdraw, staying with a small contingent of men to defend the pass at Thermopylae. This act provided time for the rest to retreat and save their lives. All the soldiers who remained died in the battle. While details about Ephialtes' betrayal are sparse, Herodotus suggests his motive was the hope of a reward from Xerxes. However, this reward never came to fruition, as the Persians ultimately lost the war. The Greeks issued a bounty for Ephialtes' head, and although he initially fled into exile, he later returned to Antisira, where he was killed by Athenides of Trachis, not for the bounty, but for unknown reasons. Nonetheless, Athenides received a reward for his action. After these events, Ephialtes' name was stigmatized for a long time. It became synonymous with nightmare and was associated in Greece with the archetype of a traitor, similar to the way the name Judas is perceived in Christianity. Marcus Junius Brutus, a Roman citizen from the Republic era, was born around 85 BC into the esteemed Junia Genes family. During Caesar's civil war, which saw Pompey the Great opposing Julius Caesar, Brutus sided with Pompey, despite Pompey having been responsible for the execution of Brutus's father years earlier. However, following the decisive Battle of Pharsalus, in which Caesar's forces overwhelmingly defeated Pompey's, Brutus promptly penned a letter to Caesar seeking mercy. In response, Caesar not only pardoned him but went further to appoint Brutus to prominent roles within the Roman administration. Yet, as a firm believer in the Republic, Brutus was fundamentally opposed to the political climate under Caesar, who had been declared dictator for life, and was enacting legislation that further centralized power around himself. Therefore, Brutus, alongside other senators including Gaius Cassius Longinus, plotted to assassinate Julius Caesar. In March 44 BC, within the confines of the theater of Pompeii, Caesar fell to the knives of Brutus and his co-conspirators. The well-known phrase, et tu, Brut. You too, Brutus? Allegedly spoken by Julius Caesar as he was stabbed by Brutus, is etched in collective memory. Yet, there is no evidence from contemporary or nearly contemporary sources to support the claim that these words, famously included in William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, were actually uttered. On the contrary, historian Suetonius notes that some authors suggest Caesar may have said in Greek, Kai si technon, you too, child? Though Suetonius also records that Julius Caesar passed away in silence, thus preserving his dignity. After Caesar's assassination, a conflict known as the Liberator's Civil War erupted, which saw his assassins, Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus, facing off against his supporters, Mark Antony, and Octavian, Caesar's adopted son and Rome's future first emperor, known as Augustus. The assassins suffered defeat in the Battle of Philippi. 
Initially, Brutus managed to evade capture, but soon afterward, cornered by his pursuers, he took his own life by falling on his sword. If there's one name synonymous with betrayal in the Western world, it's Judas Iscariot. Little is known about Judas's life before his betrayal, but the Gospel of John indicates that Judas, serving as a sort of treasurer for Jesus's group, would help himself to the gold intended for the poor. According to accounts in the four canonical Gospels, Judas betrayed Jesus in exchange for 30 pieces of silver. Judas, one of the 12 apostles, led the guards sent by the chief priests to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he identified Jesus by giving him a kiss, as agreed with the guards. After the betrayal of Jesus was completed, two alternative but similar endings for Judas are narrated in the religious texts. According to Matthew, repenting for having handed over an innocent man to the authorities, Judas attempted to return the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests, but they refused to accept them. Subsequently, Judas threw the 30 pieces of silver onto the floor of the temple where he was, then left the place and hanged himself. According to this version, the temple priests collected the coins but considered them metaphorically tainted with blood, so they could not put them in the offering box. Instead, they used the money to buy a piece of land known as the potter's field, where foreigners could be buried. According to the Book of Acts, with the money Judas obtained for betraying Jesus, he bought a piece of land, but in that very space, he stumbled, falling headlong and literally burst open. When the people of Jerusalem heard what had happened, they called that piece of land Akeldama, which means field of blood. These were among the most notorious betrayals in history, decisions that, to varying degrees, altered the course of events. Nevertheless, delving deeper than the betrayals themselves, it's captivating to contemplate the motivations and justifications concealed behind them, as these atrocious acts persist as a captivating manifestation of the deepest facets of human nature.